Since 1952, Montclair's unique, distinctive and timeless style has set the rules of a well-recognized brand based on quality, innovation and creativity. 65 years of history has made Montclair top many highs. Creativity is key. Montclair's special projects and collaborations with talents enhance it and offer to our clients outstanding experiences. We are a sustainable company. Social and environmental assets lead our business, supporting those in need and strengthening long-term value for all our stakeholders. Quality is responsibility, respect and transparency. With Montclair Genius, we continue to feed our history as well as our future. At Montclair, we believe in the power of connecting through creativity. More than 12,000 people joined the public opening of Montclair Genius. Montclair Genius. Building communities around experiences. Building communities around experience. Um, I'm sure there are people in the audience here. I was there. Um, Joe was there as well. Um, for the genius opening at Milan Fashion Week. You took the very bold step a couple of years ago of getting rid of fashion shows completely. You had done spectacles before, but you completely got rid of fashion shows and instead you rebooted Montclair again uh, 10 years after you'd bought it with Genius. And Genius is about taking eight designers inside Montclair and putting on, as we saw at the start of um, Milan Fashion Week, this performance art, as it were, near the central station. Can you talk first about what was your intention of genius and why did you make the decision to go with the genius idea? Basically, it was a decision we took like a couple of years ago because uh, the world was really changed. The world was really changed. People want, we, feel, we felt that the people want something more more energy, talk with them every day, understand what's going on in the company, what's happening in the product. And as you know, our story was a classic strategy. Our, we did uh, two fashion shows, you know, collection, seasonal project, campaign, as every other company. And honestly, a couple of years ago, I thought it was important to try to talk with the, my people on the street, my customer, my client, in a totally different way. Uh, my feeling is they need content every day. That's why we decide to move into, let's call, monthly business and not any more seasonal. And thinking and thinking, uh, I say I have to talk with the people in the industries to explain my project, but as well the people on the street. I mean, uh, sometimes it's easier to talk with the people of the industry because the, the crowd is not so big. And I say I have to build up a, a, an ideas and uh, talking with the, my people in the company, I say we have to attract different designers, we have to attract different energy, we have to build up different content. And talking, uh, Genius was the name, you know, we're looking for some genius. Genius and uh, uh, we start uh, almost one year and a half ago, the, we attract like six, seven, eight, nine, depending on the season or the years, uh, genius. And uh, we give the freedom to build up everything they want, but based on our roots, based on our history, based on our products, means it's really a joint venture between designer and the company. Mm. And that's it, you know, we're really uh, starting and uh, we launched the first collection June last year. And every month we have something to say to the customer. Every month we have a new product, a new ideas, and every day we have content. Uh, I think, I don't know if the right, the right strategy, but at the moment I'm quite happy that uh, I really have the possibility, I stress this, to talk. You know, to, uh, I understand the people, they, they un I don't know if they understand me, but at least uh, 
they listen. You mm. know, this is for me is very important. The world is very, is very different, and especially if you want to build up a strong community. I mean, uh, generation is important. You have to talk with different generations, as for me is one of the the key, you know. You've been saying that, I think, from the very start. I remember you, you talking about you wanted to, your clients were the 18-year-old to the 80-year-old, to the um, which has been persistent. But I'm going back to your point about moving from six-monthly collections so that the six-monthly cycle, which had dominated the luxury industry, the fashion industry, for the past 30 years, to a monthly cycle. How did you go about doing that? What was most difficult of doing that? How did you convince your team? This was, it was not difficult, but uh, as I always say to my people, I try to convince them and not impose anything, you know? And uh, again, <coughs> a couple of years ago, I started talking with the people closer to me. I say, we have to change something. I feel, you know, this, uh, this strategy, I don't know for the industry, but at least for Montclair is old. The people become bored, the customers become bored. I travel a lot around the world. They want to go into my store, I don't see the energy, for me, energy mm. is everything. And, uh, you know, I pushed these ideas. Uh, for the monkey people, it was quite exciting. But then when I start talking with the supply chain, logistic, and production team, they say, oh, wow, it's, <laughs> I mean, do, you know, we have six month time normally to make production, to deliver it to. Now we have one month, and every month we have to do something. Yeah, it's quite challenging. And I never push. I always say, this is my idea, let's try to talk. Let's say, maybe we're not ready one year, in two years, but I think we have to work on this direction. And after, you know, maybe one year, one year and a half, uh, we weren't ready. And honestly, the first, uh, the first season uh, was last year. Uh, I was quite, let's say, proud, you know, because every, the same day, the same hours, delivering the, the, all, all our stores, uh, I think it was quite challenging when we reached the goal. Means uh, for us was something very new. You know, Moncler, as we saw in the movie, is an old company because it was founding like 65 years ago. A base in Veneto, very close to Venezia. Very nice people, you know, around. Uh, but to convince to change sometimes is, uh, is tricky, let's say. And they really follow the idea. They really put a lot of energy in this project and you know i i, I I'm, I'm honestly to am more than happy because we every month we do something every month we talk with the customer every month we make new window new delivery new content as you know today to talk with the, <coughs> to the customer you is not enough to make an advertising campaign like six months ago six years <laughs> like many years ago i think and now today you have to make content every day you know to try to talk with them to understand the, our strategy sometimes it's not easy because the different culture around the world you know if you, you have to talk with the kids uh, in Arbin, that is north mm. china a very good market of us because it's very cold <laughs> but as well you have to talk with the people in milano in los angeles in chicago and uh, whatever means uh, you you must need a strong voice to talk mm. around uh, with the people around the world so we go back to the to the the performance, that's the only way I can think of it, that, that opened Milan Fashion Week. Um, it, this was very different. I was fascinated when I went to it uh, about it being uh, a production for content for you, which was clearly the case. I think you've probably seen amazing photographs underneath the arches of the central station of Pier Paolo Piccioli's um, Montclair puffers done as these extraordinary colour dresses. Couture, exactly. How did you, what first, do you consider that the runway show is now completely redundant in the world we're in now? I don't know for the other company again. I think for Montclair, yes. I think for the last uh, show we did in Milan, I was quite proud because, as you know, the first day we opened for the people from the industries, mm. and the second day, the day after, or two days after, we opened for the public, and we have more than 50,000 people around, and I really feel the energy that day in Milan was incredible. I mean, 15,000 people for a city, you know, normal people came from anywhere in Milan, it's not, it's not obvious. Uh, but I really, I don't want to say inclusivity is very important, but uh, for a brand as Montclair, I think the ability, you know, to attract normal people to explain what we have in, you have in mind, to show your ideas, I think is something very strong. Maybe for the other companies, they, need, they still need the fashion, the runaway classic fashion show. I don't know. I think for us, it's very, very interesting. Very interesting because... Uh, 
in today's world that is totally different than again than five years ago because I started working like 35 years ago. It was, I worked for 30 years more or less the same. Fashion show, uh, collection, you know, PT Warm or whatever, you know, it was kind of easy, shooting, campaign. In the last five years, everything changed, you know, it means, uh, and this is another important, you know, when you have 15,000 people that normally walk into the street, you have a your own show, you can share with them everything. You can imagine uh, they post uh, in, in the social network, they explain what they have in mind, the, the emotion they have. The, I think uniqueness is very important. You know, for a company as, as Moncler, as you mentioned, you know, we really care to talk with the people 18 years old. They love to make skateboard and snowboard, and also ladies, they love to wear the jacket of the Alaskala in Milano, the mm. special night. I think it is very difficult to talk with different generations. You, know, you have to talk different generations, different culture, you have to attract different, I mean, it's, it's something, that's why you need energy from anywhere. It, it, sometimes you feel you don't have enough voice to talk with them. Is you it know? very difficult, because from what you're describing, is it, is it, did you feel you needed extra courage? You've clearly had enormous amount of courage over the last 30 years to achieve, but did you need extra courage to let go of the control of your brand, because what you're saying is this idea of cross-pollination, letting people come and, and film things and, you know, and, and social networks. Do you feel you have to be, how do you deal with that? As in, because I think we've taken the part, you know, you had fashion magazines, you'd send your ads into Vogue, you'd do them every six months and there was the image. How do you feel now with allowing the images of Montclair to be distributed in the world from the starting point of your performance art. Really. I think, you know, uh, the world is very big. Uh, your voice is not strong enough. I think uh, our strategy is always based on uniqueness. You know, I think you need really strong idea, really strong product, really strong show, really strong way to talk with the people around the world. And uniqueness is everything. If you are unique, uh, you know, you can keep the att attention of some people or you, you most of the people. And, What's, what can I say? In the future, you know, I always say, when, especially when the investors, as you know, we are public, the investors, they always ask me, what do you think in 10 years, in five mm. years? Uh, sometimes <laughs> I don't answer because, <clears throat> what can I say? For sure, you, you, you need a vision in front of you, but the world is so fast that you, you have to adapt your strategy basically daily or weekly or monthly because the world changes very fast. It means you cannot say, this is my, I want to do this. I mean, I mean I honestly, Sometimes I feel confused, but I feel that you must change your idea, you, you must follow your street, but at the same time you have to evolve your strategy, you have to, I don't want to say compromise, I, I try to not have, never compromise, but if the world changes, you have to follow your customer. I mean, you, you cannot say straight on your, what I call honestly old school, you know, mm. old school when I started working was a five year plan. This is, I, I always check my plan to make my own, you know, day by day, by day life. But since three, four, five years, I think, you know, I think you have, you have to learn from the new school. You have to learn from what's happened in the digital world, around the world. Means, uh, Do you have a plan anymore, as you say, or is it something that shifts? Honestly, it's not right on paper, uh, but uh, we make three years plan always, you mm. know, because we need in the company, you know, we need the to hire people, to, but I think I always uh, think uh, what I have to do tomorrow, you know, if this plan is good for tomorrow, it's good for the next month, it goes for, or you need, you need to be changed, or need to be adapt, or need to, you know, I think, you know, the good way to work, you know, every, every Wednesday or Tuesday, I make a strategic committee with three or four people in the company. And every, every, every Wednesday I say, well, I feel, you know, you see what's going on in China, and, you know, see what's going on in America, you know, see what's the really import duty, what's up. I mean, you have to really, really follow what's going on every day. The world is really challenging. You've brought it up, China and America. This is, I'm interested in your view in real time, um, looking at your share price today, and we were discussing this, mm -hmm. um, you know, off uh, in the green room before, uh, the 2% has come off your stock, has come off a lot of stocks today on the back of what Trump is saying out of the US uh, about trade wars. How do you navigate this environment that we're in? I'm fascinated. What are your thoughts about the environment it looks like we're going into. The first half of 2019 was better, probably, than people expected. 
and suddenly the second half of 2019 is looking very rocky. Uh, you know, every, everybody in last year, they say 19 will be not very good, you know, because the world was growing from the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, the economy is still very strong. You know, the first quarter was honestly very, very good yes. all, all around the world. But again, you know, you, you never know what's happening. You know, one day, Mr. Trump wake up and say, okay, I want to make this for China. China say, okay, we want to this. I uh, don't want to give you Android anymore to the company, whatever. Google say that yesterday. I mean, what can you do? Uh, nothing. That's why I say before, you cannot live on three years plan. You must be very, very flexible. You know, tomorrow, uh, for sure, American market is huge and China is bigger than America. Uh, I mean, the, we're talking about the two biggest market could be like 50, 60 percent of luxury revenues. Means uh, it's difficult, difficult, tricky, and uh, you have to be very fast, very fast. But again, if there is a war, trade war between uh, China and the United States. You can do not do anything, you know. But maybe, as we mentioned, you know, maybe production uh, somewhere. I try always to, to have my production in Europe because I really care a lot of quality to build up a strong culture, to build up a strong, really, manufacturing expertise. But let's see. <laughs> but what, because if there's a trade war, I think, because I'm seeing this already with some Italian companies that are, are deciding to move production, some of their production to the US, to give a context of what we were, we were discussing and, and saying, and I'm talking about SMEs, I'm not talking about companies as big as yours. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about very small companies who are saying, actually, I'm going to stick some more of my production in the US because that's going to hedge me a bit if there's a trade war. Uh, just to elaborate on that, is that something that you, you, you could consider? It depends what's going on, again. Uh, my dream is one day to, to make some production in Japan, <laughs> but it's not the case of this trade war because Japan is amazing in terms of quality, in terms of expertise, in terms of fabrics. But again, let's see what's going on. Is the war, the trade will be huge. You have to, you have to solve your own problem. You know, I don't think there is enough culture in our, in our, for our industries in the United States. You know, all the company they make, let's call outerwear, they move to China. Mm. Yes, I don't want to. But uh, let's see. I mean, uh, in Italian we, we have a, a good, a good word to say that. I, I cannot translate, but. My feeling is, uh, if, you, if we need something, you know, we, we have to expect from the macro commerce everything. We, we must be flexible to follow the market, to understand what's going on, to build up a strong company. If we want to build up a strong company, you, we really must, uh, with our own strategy, with our own vision, but follow what's going on. I find it fascinating that uh, of the three entities, and I'm using that word, that in the luxury sector that have managed to, up to now, ride this bucking bronco of the, of the changing market of disruption from technology, of Chinese millennials becoming this extraordinarily powerful group of people, and now of trade wars. It's LVMH, it's Kering, which are two enormous groups. And it's yourself, which is a, a, an independent group. You're actually looking on, on the base of the share prices. Um, and, and these three are, are standing out of being able to ride this. How are you keeping in touch with trends on a daily basis? Because I know in the past, I, you have this wonderful story about how when you were traveling back between the States mm -hmm. and Italy, you saw that people were finding it difficult to put their bulky woolen coats yeah. into the top lockers. And you thought, wait a minute, you know, traveling, casual wear, I need it to be smarter. How today, though, are you keeping your finger on the pulse of what's going on? And you're clearly doing it successfully. I think uh, we're talking like three, four years ago, remember, and uh, it's, it's always the same. I think uh, go around the world, uh, watch the people walking on the street, uh, understand what's going on uh, between uh, not New York and Tokyo, but even New York. If you, again, if you walk from, uh, walk from um, Upper East Side, 82 Street, going down to 31st, you see a big difference, you know, big, big difference, the people, how they walk, how they, how they dress, how they can move. I think uh, for, my, for me, the inspiration is really people walking on the street, different country, uh, different energy. I, I, that's a few years ago, I realized that, <coughs> as you know, when I bought the company, it was a huge down jacket, sell, sell basically for, for sport, uh, for hiking in the mountain. But then I say, if I don't move my, my product from the mountain to the city, I have to be much more smart, much more light, much more easy to use. 
again walking, uh, traveling from New York to Rome or from uh, Tokyo to Hong Kong is four hour flight. But normally, sometimes you have uh, 35 degrees in Hong Kong and uh, five degrees in, in, uh, in Tokyo. You need a very light product, very light jacket, something you can put in the bag you forget when you're in Hong Kong. But then you're landing, you're landing in Tokyo, you need a jacket because it's windy. I mean, the strategy is always based on that. Be flexible, walk around, walk around the world, understand the people on the street, uh, what they're looking for, you know. And then luxury worries change a lot, you know. And again, in the last three, four years, the luxury was luxury. It means, uh, let's say, quite boring. <laughs> and now luxury is, uh, uh, you know, is really, uh, again, I, I don't like to use the word inclusivity, but this is the word because uh, we, the luxury worry attract much more people, much more young people. Mm -hmm. Uh, few company they are really uh, able to have kids in the stores and let's say ladies in the stores. This was my dream since the beginning. You know, and now uh, before all sales was very interesting on that. But now I really feel young kids, a lot of young kids also in the typical luxury street as New Bond Street, Ponte Napoleone, Faubourg Saint Honoré. I think the the, the board. I mean, again, they want, they, especially in our world, in luxury world, they need something different. They need something, you know, if you attract young kids, you have new energy. If you have new energy, you know, you can, you know, you re really have the voice to talk with every, everyone in the world. I think, again, you know, think about three years ago, no, no young generation in the luxury world. No, really, really, really small. Now, thanks to few companies that understood this, you know, now we start to attract young kids. And then it's not only a question of revenues. Again, it's really a question of uh, mix the culture, mix the people, mix the build up, you know, like in a company you have an organization, if you are able to build up a new community. And this, you, in this community you have, uh, again, young kids, uh, and every, every generation in your community, I mean, your community is super energetic, and the people understand this, the people feel that, and the people, they're gonna, I think they're going to follow you. The two big things, we talked about trade wars there, two big other issues looming over the industry. I'll start with the first one. How do you see in your crystal ball, how do you see climate change and sustainability impacting the industry, given that these are, they're on two levels, aren't they? They're the consumers responding to that and making decisions, and then actually climate change and needing to change your supply chain, for example. How do you? Sure. I think, you know, sustainability was, uh, let's say, until three, four, five years ago, was, was an accessory. Now I think it's a part of the core business. I think uh, really if you want to track uh, young generation, uh, sustainability is very, very, very important. It must be one of the base of your, of your own strategy. We already, you see on, on, the food, on the food world, on the hospitality world, you know, I think for young kids, when I was young, I don't care if my pizza was sustainable or not sustainable, or healthy or not healthy, you know. Now the kids, they love this, they want uh, natural product, they want to be sustainable as much as they can. You know, I think uh, for us it's very important. You know, really, uh, we we start working not many years ago. Honestly, we start working like five, six years ago on this project, and now my dream is to build the 100% sustainable jacket. Uh, we have recycled uh, fabrics. We have uh, we really trace all our feather. This is quite. Um, a delicate, delicate um, issue, issue. Yeah. but uh, honestly, we really feel that we are in the right way. For sure, sustainability is never finished. You know, mm. you feel every day this is the first day, mm. and, uh, but the value you have to transmit to the, your customer is, uh, is very important. I really, we're really keen. I just make a meeting like a couple of days ago in my company, I really say, I want to for the next plan, a really three years plan, very strong sustainable project because I'm really is one of the pillars, you know, base, you can base your own strategy for the future. Can I ask, because you've brought it up, what is a sustainable feather? Is that sustainable a feather is, uh, first of all, is a good feather is by product, mm. is, uh, but the problem is animal welfare. You know, you, yes. you must follow your own uh, chain to have the best, uh, uh, let's see, when you say animal welfare, you say mm. almost everything. I think you, you have to feel uh, uh, proud about your product. I think this is uh, something that uh, is really on my, one of my points for the near future. I think we reach already a very good, uh, a very good, uh, a very good level mm. of trustability and sustainability on this. But uh, we really want to be at least the best mm. in, in this world. But again, it's not very 
Mm. Again, sustainability is never finished. You know? just, it's a lot of, I presume there's a lot of additional capex on the back of doing something like that. I'm just, I'm always just sort of fascinated about the cost of sustainability. Does it? Does it, yes, does it pay back because you're able to? I think, um, you know, I don't, I think, yes, there is uh, money there, money, you spend money, but I think it is a great value for your brand. You know, if you really uh, can be Moncler, if your kids in the city say Moncler is very sustainable, I think the value of the brand is so high that, you know, mm. I think this is, uh, honestly, is one of our dream, is one of our pillars to build up our own new, new, new brand. Another point, um, it was at this conference about four years ago, if I remember correctly, Johann Rupert of Richemont uh, stood and he said he, his great concern was about big tech and that big tech had the spending power, which, you know, would so much bigger than every other industry, but including the luxury industry. And, and what would luxury do if, if big tech decided to move into, into the luxury space? What is your view if Amazon, for example, and you, you know, Amazon had this, there was this jacket on Amazon called the Amazon coat, you've probably seen this, made in China, and it was a, a puffer, at the sort of, um, and, and, and you know, people were buying it, and it cost $129.99, I think that's right. Um, what is your view about big tech and, and whether they come into lux the luxury space? That would be a problem. Uh, I think really? it's, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I, I know they work, I know they work a lot on this. They want to make uh, any, I don't remember, Amazon fashion or Amazon yeah. luxury, whatever. But I, I, I mean, I think one of the most important value is to control, you know, control. Since the beginning, again, when I bought the company, I tried to say, I have to talk directly with my, with my customer. I don't, I don't want, I want f fast feedback. It means I don't want a distributor, licensor, whatever, agent. Uh, and again, if you go to, through this huge company, you don't, you cannot, you don't have the, the relation with, you, with your customer. You don't understand what they're looking for. You don't, you don't have the feedback from you. Means uh, they can control you. You can imagine tomorrow Amazon, they have uh, all the best luxury brand. It would be, would be at least tricky and uh, I think it would be a, but they, they try. I hope, I hope for a moment it would be anyone could be independent, everyone they can make their own distribution strategy, everyone they can make their own channel, everyone they can make, you know, they control price. As you know, I really care about price. We try mm. to not make sales. And uh, I don't know if you can with this kind of huge tech company, you know. And I think uh, if you want to really have good relation with the people, good relation with your customer, I think uh, uh, sales is, uh, is quite, uh, quite tricky. I think uh, we always try to control that, even through the wholesaler, that is not easy. Mm. Especially when you talk with the big department store in America and United States, to say, I don't want to make sales, you have to buy less product. We give less product because the only way to control them is to, if they ask 100, give 50. You know, this is the only way. But sometimes when the season is not good, it's too hot in winter, they, uh, they are afraid of starting October, November, say, you want to make sales, sales, sales. And you can imagine if you are through Amazon and they, are, they become so strong that you cannot control. And let's see, I hope not, in the near, at least in the near future. We've, we've talked about this in the past. There's much discussion um, of independent brands have been, have been selling or, you know, do you see the opportunity? I know you I always like to update you, hear your latest view on this, but do you ever see the opportunity to buy something new for yourselves to add to Montclair? Add any, any brand? Any brand. I, uh, it's very, it's very <laughs> this question, especially in the they, they, they this, ask me very, very, very often. <laughs> what have in mind? Could be. I never say no, but I think is uh, Moncler is is basically a startup company. You know, since when we changed the the business, since when we go into the monthly business, you know, I think is everything new, and everything you know, everything is every day. I really found something to improve our strategy, and honestly, I want to be very concentrated, and also I want my team is very concentrated on that. But never say never. Uh, at the moment, uh, and no one they proposed me good opportunity for Montclair. But uh, I think uh, for the next two, three years, I really would love to stay concentrated on uh, on the new Montclair strategy. And you selling? Doesn't sound like you'd be keen to sell either. Sell the company? Yeah. Uh, the, nobody asked me <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I'm, I love uh, love the brand. I love uh, what we did. Uh, I think we have a lot of many things to do in the near future. 
And I told you already that I'm, I feel I'm still young to sell. So that <laughs> skiing and the exactly. boat and everything else. <laughs> and when I want to continue. And I, I have a, a, a final question as related to this. What would be your advice for entrepreneurs starting up in the, in the luxury industry at the moment? I think not follow revenues, but build up a very good brand. I think if you make a very strong brand, you have to you stay tuned with your customer. Revenues come, margins came. So, you know, I never care about margin. I think we have one of the biggest margin in, uh, in, uh, in the industries. And um, I always try to build up a strong brand. I always try to have a good relationship with my customer. I always try to make everything with the best quality possible. And I think if you work in the right way, you, you're growing. That's what the market wants. Mm. But you also can make margin, good margin. But never go compromise. You know, I think compromise is... Uh, or really, and you have to listen to everybody, but then make your own street, follow your own ideas, uh, and build a strong brand. I think it's one of the most important things. I'm going to sneak an extra one in here because I, I, we've discussed this in the past, and I, I think when I, talking to chief executives in the last three, four years, and, and, and business owners such as yourself, it seems to me in such a fast market, it's fascinating to know how you keep going and you've alluded to it there but I think your point is in the whole of your life do you work all the time or do you have balance in your life as in what are the other things you do in order to get space in your head for creativity I think is a very interesting question I don't think you have to work too much I think to you you must be fresh every morning when you go to this in the office I try to have my own weekend. Very, very rare I work in the weekend, except if we have a fashion show or whatever. I think if you, you must go, again, you must go in the office every morning fresh to understand what's going on. And I don't think it's healthy to continue working, 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 working. Uh, you need to go skiing to understand if your jacket is good. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of the most important things. But again, yeah, the balance is very important. You know, the balance between... Uh, and then uh, I think, you know, especially my job is not to stay in the office and to work. You know, it's, it's thinking, understand the people. Again, when I go skiing one day, I learn a lot. You know, I learn why they, this guy don't use this jacket. They have the, you know, the puffy one, they want a skinny one. I mean, this is a part of my job, as well as when I work in, uh, in the street in Japan, because I don't understand why they have all this backpack. They don't want, they want the hood, they, want the, they don't want the hood. I mean, this is for me is, uh, is working as well, but not in the office, closing in four walls, that sometimes is uh, too much. And I suppose my, my, I suppose when do you see, do you see many more new product categories available to Montclair, given the points you've made about? Yes, not easy, because again, as a company was founded uh, 65 years ago, a change the culture in the company is, is very, very difficult. We not buy finished garments, you know, from whatever around the world. We try to make everything in our company. Having said that, 20-25% um, on, our, on our selling is uh, made by sneak shoes, uh, knitwear, sweatshirts. But, you know, uh, again, uh, outer are continuing to grow and, and the other category growing as well. But, you know, I think culture, when you think about, you know, knitwear, for example, to build up a, a facilities in your company that we did that five, six years ago, and you have to make another company. You know, if you want to really make something consistent, you have to build up a company inside the company and be special and make product as a specialist, you know, as, as we, we did. And now knitwear is quite big, it's not big as it was, I suppose, but it's quite big. I think, we, again, we to, build, to have the best quality, to have the best, uh, we, need the, we need time, and we are very concentrated now to have different divisions in our company, shoes is one, and knitwear is another one, and we're not rush. We don't want to betray our roots. I think we are Montclair, we make jackets since 1952, we make winter jacket. Even see that, we have a, quite a good business in summer, we have quite good business also in other categories, but I think the, the brand is, when you go into the Montclair store, even in May, you must feel to be in Montclair stores. You know, this, I think this is one of the most important things. So focus, but openness to creativity exactly. as well, Tamar. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed, Mr. Ruffini.